All right, good evening, uh, everybody. This is Ethan. This is Dylan's new uh, lab hired tech. Goon. goon, hired good muscle, mechanical muscle. Hi. <laughs> Ethan, this is everybody. Henry, this is Henry, and Lena, and Harlan, and Shelly, and Myrtle, and Shirley, and Donna, and Dylan, and Joni, and Joyce. Got that? Woohoo! Yeah. And Dan, thank you, thank you. Do you know how bad I was with names? You know how much effort that took to actually get that. I had to pause at Joni. And Dylan's wife. At Dylan's wife, Mrs. Leppington. <laughs> Joni Leppington. It was a uh, Joni Leppington, so. All right, I have a little quiz to start out with. Four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. You guys will have to share. Take one and pass it on, except for Henry Lena will have to share. <laughs> Dylan, focus. Yeah. <laughs> Joyce, yeah? Keith is saying, could you please get Danny to call him when you get home? Okay. He said I tried calling, but he well, never answered his phone. Well, he called Danny's phone, but I have Danny's phone. Oh. Is there enough? Yeah. Did I have enough, or are we? Oh, oh, I, could we maybe Tell go in couples? Yeah. Sure. Oh, Tell him he can call. Six, seven, yeah. Nine, Sorry, seven, I don't, seven, didn't print off. Sorry, my mistake. We'll have to go in. Seven four two four. Yeah. All right, we're, we got enough. All right. Take a look at all those two pages and tell me which film is not real and what is the theme of those films. Which was not a real film, and what is the theme of all these films? Yeah, Left Behind End Times. Yes, on both pages. Oh, okay. The Thief in the Night, End Times. The Leftovers? Mark Redemption. It's both Two Redemption. The Leftovers? Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> a Distant Thunder. That's real. The Prodigy New World Planet. Order. Ooh, I'd watch that one. <laughs> That's happening. Can I hear Mark Two Redemption? Yes, it's Mark Two, The Redemption. The Redemptionator. The Redemptionator. Did you have to come up with a name, Dan? Uh, no, <laughs> no. Fake one? <laughs> What's that? A fake one? Because it might be helpful. <laughs> yes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Where's the forest? Oh, that's because of the forest. There we are. Good. You can't see it for the trees. We'll turn off the... Yeah, we, need, we couldn't have a forest tonight because I needed to... Uh, we're going to watch a little movie tonight. All right, anybody? Mark two, okay. Mark two, the redemption. The leftovers. The leftovers. I'm thinking what were that we supposed to guess? What was the theme? What are all these movies about? And oh, which one is not the real one? Oh, what's not the real one? Yeah. Last, last days is about end times. Yeah, they're, okay. First off, they're all about what? End times. End times. These are all a po a a rapture movies. So, Vanish, Left Behind, Left Behind 2, the one with uh, Nicolas Cage, The Dark. The Great Deceiver, Rapture, no warning, no mercy. Uh, you got to say that that guy who does the uh, trailer voice, you know, the Maybe coming the convergence, redemption. final redemption, like that one. Yeah, that one. apocalypse, caught in the eye storm, Jerusalem countdown, Why New World, like Noah that? and the Last Days. That's not a real one. What's that? Which one? Mark II redemption. Mark II the redemption. Okay, sorry. Trick question. They're all right. Really? They're all. And the leftovers was a three-part HBO miniseries about the Rapture. Well, really. well, I guess because people are left behind. Left over. Okay. Instead of left behind, Nothing they were... Says redemption like a Glock. Oh, my... yeah, yeah. <laughs> These are all real apocalypse, leftover, rapture, end times films. Uh, Distant Thunder and Thief of the Night were Don and I's era. Left Behind would be probably Dylan's era. Um, and then Mark II is more Henry and... Lena, Tina's era, it's Lena. more modern. You had it. Lena. You guessed yourself. Lena. Henry and Lena. I second guess. And Trina. And Trina. Bobina, Fofina. Yeah, I knew it. Bobina, yeah. <laughs> but I want to draw your attention to, on the first page, it's called The Rapture. We're going to watch that. It's 11 minutes, 1941. Lights. 
Lights, please. This was the first rapture movie ever made. So, 1941, the rapture, 11 minutes long. Hopefully the audio is working. Angel and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Are you ready for his return? Someday soon, in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, life will be suddenly changed for all of us. Events unspeakably strange and startling will occur with amazing rapidity. trains will plunge unsuspecting passengers into a black eternity as Christian engineers are snatched from the throttle. <laughs> Operations will be halted midway as believing surgeons are caught up to be forever with the Lord. Even the ordinary routine of life will have its annoying interruptions. There will be milk delivery unmade. There will be stores remaining closed. Transportation service will be greatly impaired by the absence of Christian motormen. Housework will be left undone because Christian maids have been promoted to higher realms. <laughs> After the rapture, there will be broken homes with fathers missing from south. Mothers missing from others. Babies snatched from others. In some homes, Bible lovers, even as they read the blessed word, will be transported into the very presence of the one of whom they read. Churches will be the scene of much confusion and bewilderment. In some, unsaved people will wait anxiously for Christian pastors who fail to make their appearance at Sunday service. <laughs> Death will be robbed of its prey as those asleep in Christ are raised to meet him in the air. What will the rapture mean to Christians? To some, it will mean joyful relief from suffering and pain, from weeping and sighing, from heartbreaking poverty, from disappointment, To all Christians, the rapture will mean removal from the presence of sin. Drinking, murder, gambling, unbelief. Oh, 
Christians, it will mean release from wars and rumors of war. That's the joyful side of it, Christian, but there is also another side of the picture, a tragically sad side. After the rapture, we will have no more opportunity to tell the lost of Jesus. To think that some will be left to go through unspeakable torments because you and I fail to tell them of Jesus. Your son, perhaps. Or your daughter. Your husband. Your wife. Your closest pal, your fellow worker, your neighbor, and to think that their blood will be required at your hand. Remember that after the rapture, there will be no more opportunity to pass out tracts. to preach about the Lord Jesus Christ. <clears throat> there we go. It goes on for a while, but that's... <laughs> Excellent. I'll give the in three, two. <laughs> Classic. Classic. That was 80 years ago that film was made. 1941. Hard to put that in perspective, isn't it? Those of us who grew up in the 1970s certainly grew up with that environment, right? Thief in the Night, Distant Thunder, Larry Norman. I wish they'd all been ready. Well, we're moving into the book of Luke as Jesus moves into that section. I thought, first off, that was just a curiosity. Uh, but secondly, I thought, what an interesting perspective on things to come. All right, so here's notes for tonight. I was going to show clips from all the other 13 movies, but uh, <laughs> might be here for a while. We do have to look up Mark II, the Redemptionator. Because... <laughs> I think I made 11 copies, so I'm not sure if there's... And if you're watching us online, uh, you should have, should have been able to find that PDF that was on Facebook today. As well as you got these funky pictures. All right. We're in the middle of talking about the, the now not yet kingdom and what it means to live in this now not yet kingdom. And we're at this little section at the end where Jesus has been walking down the road and he's on the way to Jerusalem and he begins to do a series of, of teachings. And the first thing he talked about uh, was how money works in the kingdom. And anybody remember from last week what Jesus' basic message about money was? Oh, we missed you missed it. You were here, yeah. Use it wisely so in heaven people will thank you. <laughs> yeah, use it wisely so in heaven people will thank you. That was Jesus, the gist of Jesus' message on money. Money's a tool, uh, and it's a tool to be used wisely and make friends with it on earth so that they will welcome you in heaven. It's one of those weird verses, but uh, that's there. All right, so, yeah, use it money. That's right in front of you. Look at that, the answer. This is adult education. It's easy. The answers are in front of you. That, uh, and then he talked about the law and marriage. And that the law does not give us a free pass on divorce. Anybody remember from last week what were the, what were the grounds for divorce within first century Judaism? Pretty much anything. Pretty gentle. Yeah. Remember, if you found a woman who was better looking than the one you had, you could divorce her. Uh, and we read from some original sources giving reference to those things. So laws were pretty loose. And Jesus says the, the law does not give us a free pass on divorce. Uh, and then the link between the law and money and how the rich man and Lazarus looked at those stories. So anyhow, that's just up to speed. And now we are up to evidence of the kingdom now here. 
So here we go. We are at uh, the next little event. Starting in 17, 11 to 19. Okay. Joyce, do you want to read 11 through 13? 17? Yes, please. Now on his way to Jerusalem, Jesus traveled along the border between Samaria and Galilee. As he was going into a village, ten men who had leprosy met him. They stood at a distance and called out in a loud voice, Jesus, Master, have pity on us. So why did they call from a distance? Because they had leprosy, and lepers weren't allowed to approach anybody. Leprosy is a communicable disease. You've got to keep six feet away. You know, you've got to do your whole... Your social distancing, the original leprosy, the original social distancing. <laughs> yeah, now you get <laughs> that. Uh, so yeah, so then they're, they're yelling, "Have mercy on us!" Right? And what does he say, and what doesn't he say in fourteen? What's missing in fourteen? So he doesn't call them, okay? And normally Jesus would get close, right? We'd see him make mud, spit in somebody's eye, touch their, you know, do all kinds of things. He doesn't do any of that. What else is missing? He doesn't really tell them why he's doing it. I mean, he doesn't really tell them anything. He doesn't tell Everything's missing, isn't it? Yeah. Does he heal them? No. Not at all. He, he, what does he do? Sends them away. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. Go show yourself to the priest. And as they were going, they were, they were cleansed. So these 10 guys yelling, you know, heal us. And Jesus says, go show yourself to the priest. They turn around and start walking away. And as they're walking, they start getting healed, which is the, one of the weirdest healings in Jesus' ministry. No contact, no, you know, you'll be healed. No, I forgive your sins. Just go. And as they're going, uh, they start getting cleansed. So... It's this remarkable moment. What are the unusual healings? Is there a case? Yes. Ah, very good, Harlan. Yes, because that'll come into play. Verse 15, uh, Joey. One of them, when he saw he was healed, came back, praising God in a loud voice. So we get the, the one in ten, and he is excited because he looks down and he sees... He's healed. He's healed, and he comes back praising God. Uh, and then, Joey, keep reading 16, if you'd be so kind. He threw himself at Jesus' feet and thanked him, and he was a Samaritan. There's one of those little Paul Harvey moments, like, and da da da. You know, he was a Samaritan, the outcast, the hated, right? Jesus has dealings with Samaritans, and there are always these moments of mercy and grace uh, to people he's not connected. But he comes close to Jesus. He falls down on his face, so he's now close, right? He was far off, and now he comes close, and he is full of gratitude, giving thanks to Jesus. And what does Jesus say, Dylan, in verse 17? Jesus asked, were not all ten cleansed? Where are the other nine? Was, was Did, no one found to return and give praise to God except this foreigner? Then he said to him, rise and go, your faith has made you well. There we go. Harlan, you alluded to that earlier on, right? It was their, they connected to their faith. And I don't want to say it was their faith that healed them. Jesus healed them. Yeah. But there's an element there that is tied to their faith. The question I, um, comes to mind was, were they, was this man saved? And that's a really evangelical question, isn't it? Did this man come to saving knowledge of Jesus, or was he simply healed? He was just healed, I think. By all accounts, right? There's no, your faith has made you whole. Mm -hmm. they, they, are, they are healed, right? And off they go. So what's the point of this story? Why is this tucked in here, this little section about the kingdom? Jesus has been teaching about the nature of the kingdom, the values of the kingdom. We saw last week, uh, Jesus values the innocent. Uh, we saw how Jesus speaks about wealth, about marriage. And it's, it's caught in this section that Luke is saying, here's what life in the kingdom is like. Bang, bang, bang. And now he throws in this story, which may or may not be in chronology, but it's in here. So why is this story stuck in the section on what is the kingdom like? I would guess that just the fact that he makes point that he was a Samaritan okay. means he was not a Jew and probably, probably assuming that he was not a believer. So it's not like all this grace and mercy and healing is reserved just for the Jews. Uh, it's for 
everybody. Good. Even Who? the Samaritans, even the unbel unbelieving. But right. like these guys, it says here too, didn't they? They, they said Jesus master. They yeah, master. they acknowledged that. So they knew yeah. who he was. Mm -hmm. They understood who he was or who he was claimed to be. Right. But they called him master. They didn't call him Lord. No. Nope. But they called him master. So they probably figured he was a pretty awesome teacher. Yeah. With some tricks up his sleeve. Mm -hmm. But I don't know. Good. So who, you know, I, I was speaking of the Jews. We're not speaking of the, you know, the, the people of that time. Um, who would do you most likely think they thought the kingdom was for? For themselves, right? And who is outside the kingdom? Everybody else. Yeah. <laughs> the, the, it took a lot of courage for him to go to Jesus. It sure did, yeah. yeah. And that's gratitude. Gratitude will give you a, a change, your, change your life. The Samaritans weren't welcome in the kingdom, were they? They were the people outside the kingdom. And who else would have been outside the kingdom? The lepers. The lepers, the unclean, yeah. right? Because they couldn't go to temple, they couldn't offer sacrifice. They would be, you know, ritually... At outside the kingdom and certainly a Samaritan. So these guys were double cursed. They were Samaritans and they were sick or they were lepers. So they had no hope of entering the kingdom. And what does Luke say? Guess who gets to be in the kingdom? The outsiders, the outcasts, and the sick. And it was almost like throwing mud at the people who were there who were saying, <clears throat> you know, we're, we're of the kingdom, you know. Um, it'd be like, you know, pulling up on a Honda at Sturgis and saying, I belong, you know, like, <laughs> you know I'm one of you on my little, four, my little Vespa, my little Italian scooter with your little, you know, nylon jacket. Oh. That, uh, so, but even the, the other nine, they were still healed. They, absolutely. Yeah. His grace covered even the people who were grateful. That's well, that's really good, Shelley. Grace covers even does those it, who aren't does grateful. Does it mean that they weren't grateful? No, but they didn't say thank you. That's yeah. right. Yeah. But you know, you look at that and you go, were. oh, but so was, not, was it's only... It's not in here, right? Yeah. yeah. That they were. So it says your your faith has made you well. So are you really like, well, was he the only one that actually was? No, they're clowns. The story doesn't backtrack. Yeah. Yeah. A little yeah. Too, the other nine were a little bit too wound up. Yeah. Yes, this... Oh, they were probably got caught up. Well, yeah, he, they're, and the thing is, they're doing what they were told. They were told to go to the yeah. teachers. They obeyed Jesus. So it's not like they're... But this guy comes back with this extra measure of gratitude. Much is made of his return, but I think the point of the text is, in this whole section on who's in the kingdom and who's outside the kingdom and what the kingdom is like, the kingdom is for the Samaritan and the sick, which would have not been embraced by the kingdom. Or do you think it means that the kingdom is for the grateful? Or the one showing gratitude. Humility. Yeah, yeah, that's good too, Dylan. The kingdom is for the grateful. The one that, because, you know, you got nine people that just kind of, you know, take the hand out and, cool, gone. And there's only one that says, thanks, I appreciate that. I recognize what you did for me. Hmm. You could flip it. You could say, the kingdom is for the grateful, but those who are grateful are for the kingdom. Hmm. Like, those who are truly grateful are champ advocate and champion the kingdom. Yeah. And yes, the kingdom is certainly belongs to the grateful. But those who are grateful will champion the cause of the kingdom. I think both fit. We can flip it this yeah. time. You can't always invert ideas. Yeah. You know, it's X for Y and Y for but X. I always look at that as, you know, some people go, oh, well, I believe in Jesus. I'm going to heaven and right on. And right. I'll say sorry for what I did. And there's my meal ticket home. Right. And that's... Versus the people that go, Jesus died for my sins. I know what that means as far as a price and a cost for me. And I will live in gratitude for that. Yes. And that... Yeah, you could infer because that from the just text. Just that yeah. recognition and, oh, yeah. I'm healed. Cool. And, and one of the hallmarks of the kingdom, is, the other thing that Luke is teaching, is that one of the hallmarks of the kingdom is gratitude. The, you know, the hallmarks of the kingdom are people who do well with their money, who do well with their marriage, who understand these things. But the, one of the hallmarks of the kingdom is grateful people. And gratitude is a sign of the citizens of the kingdom. You know, we talk about what does it mean to be a citizen of Canada? What are the hallmarks, you know, of being a Canadian? What are the hallmarks or the... The identifying marks. Yeah, you know the old joke, you can tell a Canadian he's ignorant and apathetic, and he'll say, I didn't know that and I don't care. <laughs> that, that, you know, kind of this defining moment of a Canadianism, so to speak. I think one of the defining moments of, the king, of citizens of the kingdom is gratitude, a life of gratitude. Because yeah. we're, we're all Samaritans and lepers, let's say so. We're all unclean, we're all sinful, and we're all outcasts, and we've all been healed. Uh, and we are, we are these people in the story you know, who we identify with. But this does not sit well with the keepers of the teachers of the law. Verse 20. 
Ethan, are you a reader? Yeah. You want to, uh, could you read 20 and 21 for us? Once on being asked by the Pharisees when the kingdom of God would come, Jesus replied, The coming of the kingdom of God is not something that can be observed. Nor will people say, here it is, or there it is, because the kingdom of God is in your midst. Good, thank you. So as he goes along, now there's a bit of a pause. Now having been questioned by the Pharisees, whether the Pharisees are right there in the immediate moment, we don't have to worry about the setting this up like a film, who's, who's where, but it, it happens nearby or relatively nearby. So the Pharisees say, uh, so it looks like the kingdom just showed up. Why? Because 10 men just got healed, right? They are pretty excited. It looks like the kingdom is starting to happen. So when is the kingdom of God coming? Because Jesus looks like he's a herald of the kingdom. John the Baptist is the herald of Jesus. And Jesus looks like the forerunner or the precursor or the herald or the, the little baby steps of the kingdom. It looks like the kingdom's about to happen. And so the Pharisees say, uh, tell us, when is the kingdom of God coming? And they are pretty excited. All right, taking your notes here. This is, uh, over the next two pages, we're not going to obviously read everything. There's, I always give you more than you need. This is the uh, first covenant's understanding of the kingdom of God. As, as they would say, as they use this language, the kingdom of God, here's probably, and you know, I can't guarantee what's in their thoughts, we don't know, but this is the traditional teachings uh, within rabbinical Judaism of the kingdom. So there are three phases to the kingdom. The first is the old kingdom or the first kingdom. And that's the dominion over earth before the call of, of Abraham. When we get Adam and Eve and all these things, when God had dominion. Uh, dominion over creation was given to uh, Adam and Eve in Genesis 1. Uh, through the fall, dominion was lost and Satan became the prince of the power of this world. And then after the flood, the principle of human government was established under what's called the first covenant of Noah, or uh, the second, uh, Adam's the first covenant, Noah's the second covenant. Uh, and this becomes the charter of all government, the Noahic covenant. So we get the original kingdom of God under Adam and Eve and kind of that early phase of what we would call the patriarchs uh, and Noah. That's the first dominion, the first kingdom. But then the second kingdom gets ushered in what's called the theocratic or the kingdom of God through the kings uh, in Israel. So we get Abraham being called and the people are called to be, come out and become a distinct people uh, that would bless all nations through them. And part of the purpose of there was to establish the kingdom of God as it were. And we get Moses, the judges, the kings, and all ending up. So we get the, the big earthly kingdom under David and uh, Jeroboam and Rehoboam and all those guys that were the kings. And so that's called the theocratic kingdom. Now that disappears, right? As Israel and the 10 tribes go into captivity, and then as Judah and Benjamin, the two tribes ultimately end up in captivity in Babylon and then 70 years later returning. And then we get the hope of the future restoration of the kingdom. So these Pharisees were saying, okay, we understand these first two kingdoms. We understand the Noahic Adamic kingdom. We understand the theocratic kingdom under David and Solomon. When is the future restoration going to come? That makes sense, the question they're asking. They're asking about number three, uh, this eternal covenant. When is David's throne going to be restored? The, you know, Emmanuel going to come, the Prince of Peace was going to come. Ezekiel says, I will set over them one shepherd, my servant David, and he will feed them and th he will feed them himself and be their shepherd and I will be their Lord and will be their God and my servant David will be prince among them. So this promise of the Davidic kingdom and um, there's a whole lot more I will not go through it all. Uh, so they're asking about the third kingdom. You don't have to worry about page three, that's just there for your reference. If you want to, for further reading, read page three. Some real bathroom material. That's right, yeah. <laughs> but with my crosswords. That's right. And you're... <laughs> so they're looking for the signs of the kingdom for the return of the, of the theocratic, of the, of the king, king the, re the restoration of David's throne. And they had seen this a few times. There had been a few people who had tried to restore the throne and you know, rebellions against the Roman Empire, and the, the empire kept crushing them. 
And along comes Jesus, and they're saying, well, you're talking about the kingdom, you're talking us how to live in the kingdom, we're seeing evidence of the kingdom, the, the blind are given sight, the deaf are hearing, the lepers are healed, you know, you're, you're embracing our, our estranged brethren, the, the Samaritans, you're bringing them in and saying they're part of the kingdom. So what does Jesus say, uh, Dylan, uh, sorry, that Ethan read for us, the kingdom of God is, Within you. Uh, just before that though, here it is. is not coming with signs to be observed. Does that make does that fit with you, or does that sound a little odd? Where does that sit in your brain when Jesus says it's not going to come with signs to be observed? You won't know. You won't know. Okay, good. We're going to land on that in a few minutes, Harlan. Very good. So maybe isn't a physical change. Okay, there might not be visible evidence of the kingdom like you thought there might be. Okay. Mine says the kingdom of God does not come with your careful observation. Ah, uh, okay, with your careful observation. It's just yeah, it's just gonna come. It's gonna oh, in be here. Eye, yeah. yeah. Oh, good. We'll get to that phrase in a second. That's that's well, I don't know, but it, too, it says here it's because it says it's not. It, it, nor people will say here it is or there it is because the kingdom of God is within you. It, yours says so within, you. Yeah. within you. Within you. With that's interesting. Mine says in your yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what mine says too. In your midst, what do you have, Joyce? That's all I have within NIV, you. NIV, 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 right? What do you have, Ethan? There. Yeah. Within you. See, me and Shirley have the same thing. Then we're right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> There's some debate about what that phrase means because I, I have a New American Standard. It says the kingdom of God is in your midst. What's the difference between saying the kingdom of God is within you and the kingdom of God is in your midst? Is there a difference in meaning? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because it's yeah. more than in you. Within you, in you limits. And, with, and yeah. in your midst would be around you, but yeah. Yes. So you could say that the the Holy Spirit is in and around and amongst. And Absolutely. You could argue the you could you could not argue, but you could present a pretty convincing position that the kingdom of God is within you. He's not confined to this fleshy jar. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Or it could be Jesus is saying, if you behold, the kingdom of God is here right now. Among you. Among you. Ah, very good, Harlan. Among you. You must have had your Wheaties today, Harlan. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and who would that be? Who would be the kingdom of God? Jesus. Jesus. He could be saying, behold, I am in your midst. And wherever I am, the kingdom of God is. So he could be saying, I am the kingdom of God. And because I'm here, the kingdom of God is here. Now, here's, here's where it dovetails nicely with what uh, Dylan's saying. Where does Jesus reside now? Think back to Sunday school. In my heart. In my heart. I've got the, yeah. Did you ask? I mean, where? Jesus, it's your heart. <laughs> the spirit of God dwells within us, right? Like, uh, like Donna told her coworkers, did you ever tell them that the spirit of a first century Jewish carpenter lives inside you? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and next time they're asking, what do you believe? You believe I believe that the spirit of a first century Jewish carpenter lives inside me. That sounds very new agey, doesn't it? Well, when you put it that it just way. might catch. Yeah, when you put it that way, it sounds. If you said that on the radio, that might work. Yeah, yeah exactly. I believe that I'm possessed by the spirit of a first century Jewish carpenter. That'll land. That's a new angle. So it, 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 I think it's a both and. You know, the spirit of God is in our midst, is within us. The spirit of the kingdom of God dwells within you and I. If he was talking, maybe sorry, yeah. to you, but if no, he no. was talking to the Pharisees, like was not Joseph the the guy that Jesus was buried in his tomb? He was one of the Pharisees, right? No, he was just a really nice guy. Oh, I thought he was one of the. No, he's just a rich dude. Oh. He's Joseph Arimathea. But what, maybe perhaps, and I mean this is guessing. Hey, let's go for it. But some of these Pharisees um, asked by the Pharisees, and I'm sure there's people there that. Knew who he was and believed in him. Absolutely, because he he's with the disciples. So maybe that's why he says it's in your midst because it's it's me and it's living in him and him and him and yep. it's it's right here. I and it's both and. I would be very content with both and. Yeah. Yeah. To say that wherever Jesus is, the kingdom is, and where is Jesus? Through the Spirit of God dwelling within us, or is the Spirit of Christ within us? Um, so I think you can say both. But it flies in the face of they were looking for this theocratic king. They were looking for the return of the Davidic kingdom. And this is why we call it the here and not here kingdom, because the kingdom is here. So Jesus, in one breath, says this, the kingdom of God is here. And then the very next verse, and he turns and says to the disciples, 
The days will come when you will long to see one of the days of the Son of Man, and you will not see. Because the kingdom's not here yet. So is the kingdom of God here? Yes. Is the kingdom of God here? No. Uh, it's, it's an... Um, it, it's coming. You're it's, speaking in riddles, man. I know, that's... Yeah. It, he only spoke... Yeah, riddle me this. Where is the kingdom of God? I have to start carrying a cane with a question mark on top. I'll do a Jim Carrey impersonation later. Oh, that'd be great. And that's why we call it the now-not-yet kingdom. Are you holy? <laughs> Don't <laughs> escort... <laughs> We're not talking about based on your behavior. Yeah. <laughs> are you holy? <laughs> we are because of Christ in us. Absolutely. Yeah. So we are holy, right? Are you holy? <laughs> no, exactly. Is the kingdom here? Most definitely. Is the kingdom not here? No. <laughs> and that's this, that's this. I was meeting with a fellow pastor this week and he was wrestling with the COVID issues. They said, you have to teach people how to live in tension. <laughs> you know, and and because it's both and you know, are we free? Yes. Do we follow the rules? Yes. Can my ladies have coffee together? Yes. You know, <laughs> can we do a work day at the hangar? Yes. You know, <laughs> should I hug you in public? No. You know, um, so it's both and. We've got to learn to live in this tension, right? And Jesus says the kingdom's here, and they'll go, oh, wonderful. And he says the kingdom's not here, <laughs> and you can see them going, which is it? So living in tension. Um, all right, sorry, I got lost in the train there. It was a good one, though. Fireworks. Oh, all right. Squirrel. 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 Oh, we forgot the squirrel. I got a squirrel. If, if, <laughs> if the kingdom of God is wherever a, a Christian is, but yes. he says wherever two or more are gathered in my name, so right. when you're by yourself, are you invalidated? You have to be with somebody else? No, the two or more is about authority. Oh, I see. Yeah. Two or more is... because. Because two or more have to witness and come into agreement. Oh, okay. So, because that, when two or more admits, that's about church, that's church discipline, right? Oh, okay. So wherever two or more are gathered in my name, there I am also. That makes, that means whenever two Christians are there, there's always three. Mm. Make sense? Mm -hmm. I am there also. Mm -hmm. And he's talking about, don't bring charges against somebody without three witnesses. Mm -hmm. And so it's about uh, the disciplining of, of believers. And, oh, okay. You, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, the kingdom is... Whenever you're with Christ, you're always with. You're never alone. The kingdom is always there. I mean, you could argue a pretty good Trinitarian argument because you could. Well, now we're dancing <laughs> on the head of angels here. You love a good argument. I do. I love a good. I love a good nuance because the Spirit of God is the Spirit of Christ, who is this Holy Spirit. You get this Trinitarian thing happening all at one time. It's kind of crowded. Real fast. It does. It should be less room for us then. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. All right. So now on to the coming kingdom. So that's the here and now kingdom. Evidence of the here and now kingdom is the salvation of the, of the Samaritans and the healing. So healing, uh, the acceptance of the outcast being brought into the kingdom. A kingdom is an expression of gratitude. And then he begins to move into the not yet kingdom. All right, this is the fun where we, this is where we start to get into left behind and lost in the barons and all that kind of stuff. Lost in the barons. That's a different story, isn't it? <laughs> Farley 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 is that about a dog? <laughs> that was two boys, wasn't it? One dog. <laughs> there had to be a squirrel in that story. <laughs> At least a polar bear. No, it's good. It's good. <laughs> All right. The days will come. Okay, now we're talking the future. He says the kingdom is here and the days will come. Verse 22, Donna. 22, 23. Okay. And he said to the disciples, The days shall come when you will long to see one of the days of the Son of Man, and you will not see it. And they will say to you, look there, look here. Do not go away and do not run after them. All right, look up at 21 and 23. They're almost the same. Nor will they say, look, here it is, or there it is, for the kingdom of God is in your midst. Then they will say, look here, look there, look here, because it's not here. He almost uses the exact same language to describe both kingdoms. So look here, look there, it's here. Look here, look there, it's not here. So he uses parallel language structure to describe both kingdoms. The kingdom of God is here, but it's not here. Don't go away and don't run after them. Don't, if people start saying, oh, Christ is coming, don't, don't follow them. It's almost like, he, you know, the false teachers, right? If somebody has to tell you he's come back, you must be living under a rock. That's right. If somebody says Jesus has returned, don't listen to them anymore. Yeah. How many of the prophets have been right so far? 
these days? Yeah. <laughs> Zero, yeah. The success rate for the well, declaring... you just got to keep waiting. You just got to hold on. You got to keep moving the goalposts. Yeah, we just got to wait. We've talked about moving the goalposts. <laughs> All right, uh, pick it up. 24, Donna. For just as the lightning, when it flashes out of one part of the sky, it shines to the other part of the sky, so will the Son of Man be in his day. Okay, what's Jesus saying here? all happen and everybody will see it. Right. Not it's not it. here yet, but when it happens, you're going to know. You're, you're going to know. know. <laughs> Don't worry. Don't want to say, is it here? Is it there? Jesus says, listen, when this happens, you're going to know it. Lightning will flash in the sky. It'll be like lightning flashes in one part of the sky or and then shines onto the other part of the sky. In other words, it, you don't have to see the lightning to know the lightning's flashed, right? Because mm -hmm. the whole cloud will light up. So the lightning may be behind you, but the reflection says no matter where you are, you will see the flash of lightning. So Which makes some, you wonder a little bit, will it be a, a C thing or will it be a no thing? Or well, I think it'll be a YouTube no, thing. A YouTube thing. <laughs> <laughs> That's why it flashes here and it's everywhere. That's right, yeah. I, you know, we used to talk in the 70s about when the, you know, the return, how will everybody be able to see it at once? Our technology yeah. makes it possible oh, for global communication. Yeah. Yeah. Facebook Live. Face, the, the second return. Facebook Snapchat. Live. <laughs> Try, it'll be on TikTok. Like it'll Google be King, eh? everywhere. Michael Davin on TikTok. <laughs> Fire <Farmer Mike. laughs> yeah. So you get what Jesus is saying? They said when. He said, don't worry, it's here. They said when. He said, don't follow those who say it's here, it's here. Because when it does happen, it will be with, with certainty. You will know that I have returned. As lightning flashes in the sky in one part is reflected in the other, it will be a guarantee. There is a certainty to his return. You'll know it when you see it. Very good. Uh, okay, uh, surely, verse 25. Uh, but first he must suffer many things and be rejected by this generation. Okay. There's a little caveat. He says there's some things that have to happen before the return of the Son of Man or the coming of the kingdom, and that is his death, right? So he's prophesying his death. Uh, already. So he puts a caveat in, says, it's coming, the, the kingdom is coming, but I must suffer first before the kingdom is ushered in. So it puts a little spot there. All right, uh, 26, Myrtle, please. Just as it was in the days of Noah, so also will it be in the days of the Son of Man. Uh, 27 as well. People were eating, eating, drinking, marrying, and being given in marriage up to the day Noah entered, to, uh, entered the ark. Then the flood came and destroyed them all. Good. So what was happening in society and life until Noah entered the ark and the, and the bowels of the earth opened up and the water came out? They were doing like they were doing today. Normal everyday life. Normal yeah. everyday life. Yeah. Just life. Eating and drinking, marrying. None the wiser. Yeah, none, exactly. They were just living life. So that's what's going to be like, because remember they, somebody said, they'll, they'll be prophesying, saying, he's coming here, he's coming then. He says, Jesus says, no, no, no. Life will just go on like normal until that, until that day. So, you know, almost like saying don't expect anything unusual. Just life's going to go on and all of a sudden, you know, there's going to be a huge change. It's, Which makes you feel like there's not a whole lot of value to spend a whole ton of time to figure out when it's going to be. Oh, good, because now you've got my conclusion. Oh, oh, sorry. Sorry. <laughs> See you next week. Yeah, <laughs> next week when Dylan does the study. No, um, we're going to talk about why prophecy is in Scripture. Yeah, yeah he says, because he says, relax a little bit. You know, you're expecting the kingdom to come. You'll know it when it happens. It'll be just like normal. Life went on, and then the flood came. And then it won't. And then it won't. <laughs> oh, yeah, then that's how you're going to get there, but then it won't. All right, uh, 28, Shelley. So life was going on. Eating, drinking, buying, selling, planting. I like how he just kind of describes what happens in life, right? You eat, you drink, you buy, you sell, you plant, you build. 29, Shelley. But the day last, but the day lot last autumn, fire and sulfur rained down from heaven and destroyed them all. Do you see the parallel with Noah? What's the parallel event? Destruction. Destruction, one by fire and brimstone, one by water. Mm -hmm. What's the other parallel? Suddenness. Regular life. Regular until life. The moment it happens. I mean, exactly. The ordinariness of life. There was no panic and scatter until it was all over. Yeah, exactly. There was a lot, a lot of 
sin and lawless stuff. Yes. But it's interesting, Jesus doesn't draw attention to that. He doesn't say, and they were sinning. These are just mundane things he describes. But they're hormones. Oh, all right. <laughs> Genesis nineteen. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I love it when a plan work comes together, <laughs> and when, when somebody's ahead of me. What's his name? Harlan. No, no, no. <laughs> I love it when a plan comes together. Oh, okay. The eighteen. Oh, uh, Murdoch. Mur no, not. <laughs> Yeah, the guy with the cigar. Yeah, the guy with the cigar, Liam Neeson. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, the the doom of Sodom is in nineteen, and who foretells the doom of Sodom? The angels come, right? They were forewarned by angels. Morning dawn, the angel, uh, verse fifteen. The angels urged Lot, take up your wife and daughters here, and they'll be swept away in the punishment of the city. So we get the angelic visitors coming. Now they didn't have a ton of warning, but Lot did. Lot knew for the angelic visitors, right? So it's a short announcement. In Noah's case, how long announcement did they get? How long were they prophesied? Oh, hundred long years. Time. They had to build the ark. So in Noah's day, they got a hundred years of warning. In Lot's day, Lot gets one night. But they were forewarned. Something was going to happen. Judgment is coming. And Lot was given a very brief amount of time. So our, our, our two stories don't parallel in the time frame. They parallel in the fact that there was... Normal life occurred, someone began to warn people, in Noah's case, a great deal of time, in Lot's case, a very brief amount of time, and then judgment came. In Noah's case, judgment came through flood. In Lot's case, judgment came through fire and water. And so the sense of judgment, warning, and then, sorry, uh, normal life, warning, and then judgment. But on the day the fire rained down. There we go, verse 30, Harlan. Afterwards, Lot left the Lord, fearful of the people there. And oh, sorry, sorry, back in Luke 17. Oh. My apologies, Harlan. So then do you think Noah was warning people up until the day, or did he tell them and then left them alone for 100 years? I think he was probably telling them the whole time, yeah. as he's building. Well, they were making fun of him for building that ark. Yeah, yeah. so I think he was probably preaching the whole time. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, so, it will be business as usual, right up to the hour of my return. Yep. So the point of the two stories is what? <laughs> what? What translation do you have, Harlan? I like that. <laughs> Just business as usual. <laughs> yeah. I love that. Yeah. Sorry, what did you say? That? So I don't know. So the, Jesus explains the point of the, of the two parables. He says, so it'll be just business as usual until the day I return. And then, dun, 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 he starts to then reveal the flood and the fire and the brimstone that are going to occur. Verse 31, Lena. <laughs> are you up for it? Yeah. Perfect. In that day, he would, which shall be upon a host top, and his stuff in a host, let him not come down to take it away. And he that is in a field, let him likewise not return back. Very good, thank you. He said, it's going to be what? What's the warning here? Sudden, right? Yeah. yeah. You're not going to have time. Yeah. And he's, he says, when that time comes, don't worry about your stuff. The stuff in your house, the stuff in your field, it's, it's going to happen in such a, 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 a flash, in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye, as Donna said earlier on, like a thief in the night <coughs> or a distant thunder. You're not going to have time to think about that. And then he pulls up the, the lot. He says, remember Lot's wife. Because she turned back, right? Mm -hmm. She was told not to turn back. She looks around the, and she looks back and she looks and she suffers consequences for that. So he says, look, when I come back, don't worry about your stuff. You know, that's not what's important in that moment. And then he pulls up a familiar phrase in 33. Whoever seeks to keep their life will lose it, just like Lot's wife, right? She wanted to keep her old life, as it were, and she lost her life. And whoever is willing to lose their life like Lot, who ran forward, who was willing to leave it all behind. Noah didn't try and keep his old life. He was willing to, by faith, build the ark and give up his old life. Um, and he gained his life. Those who tried to keep their lives and not go on the ark. You know, see, see the parallel he's developing? That makes sense? Fits? 
So that's where this passage, Jesus re- does this out a few times. Now here's the tricky one. Okay, so we, we're good so far? Mm-hmm. Okay, I tell you, uh, Henry, verse 34. I tell you on that night there will be two in one bed. One will be taken and the other will be left. Good. So he says on that night, now we're going to get to taken in a second. Uh, he gives three images of the suddenness of the return. He's already given a few images, like lightning, like the flood, like fire and brimstone, like uh, Lot's wife. All these things are quick, right? The, the, the return is, is in, a, in a heartbeat. And he says two are going to be sleeping, and one will be gone. One will be taken, and one will remain. Now, we'll stick with that. We're going to explore the word taken in a minute. Uh, okay, 35, Joyce. Two women will be grinding grain together. One will be taken and the other left. Good. Now, in your Bibles, is there a little bracket around 36? Yeah. Yeah. Anybody else got a little note around 36? Oh, oh I don't even have a 36. That's right. You may not have a 36. Oh, we don't. You don't have a 36, oh, right? Mine's at the bottom of the page. Yours at the bottom of the page, here. yeah. That, that's called an inclusion. Um, what was probably was happening was a monk, because this is a passage from Matthew uh, we're going to look at in a minute. Uh, and what was probably what was happening, a monk was writing it, and he did that, and one will be taken, you know, two will be writing, and he started quoting Matthew in his brain and just wrote it down. So he added to the text. Now, not that this Jesus, not that Jesus didn't say 36, he just didn't, just Luke didn't okay. put it in his book. So it doesn't mean it's not there. It's just a, 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 There's a couple of places in there. Yeah, slop, we call them sloppy monks. <laughs> you know, sloppy monks, sloppy scribes. You know, it's late, they're tired, they're writing by candlelight. You know, there's a lot of issues. There's, there's, Some comics at the bottom of the page. Yeah, they're doodles. That would be awesome. Dead Sea Scroll with a comic at the bottom. <laughs> A little graffiti. <laughs> what some of the old manuscripts actually on the side column have, they'll have a number, and that's the number of characters in that line. So what they would do is they'd say, this line of Luke 18 should have, you know, like, I don't know, we'll just take 22, where it says, in my Bible it says one and, that'd be three, he, five, four, said, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17. There'd be 18 characters in that, so there'd be an 18 beside, so he would know when he was done, there's supposed to be 18 characters in that line. So that was kind of a quality control issue. Mm. Oh, okay. So they, every manuscript would be the same numerically that way. So it's just one more way of making sloppy monks stay on task. Hmm. That works. And the King James Version is still the original. That's what. What's that? The old King James Version. Is not <laughs> exactly. King James is the only one. Does it have 36, does it have 36 in there, Myrtle? No. Mine does. Okay, I, yeah, I, mine has brackets, and like Shelley's, you have a, a little addenda note on the bottom. Yeah, it's missing. It's missing. There's something missing. Yeah. Two men will be taken in the field, one will be taken. Two men will be in the field, one will be taken and left behind. This one says some manuscripts left, and then in 36 yeah, mine it says, says the same. two men. Yeah, and that's one of those, just, it, it's called a variant reading, and sometimes there, there's different readings. Variant readings don't change the meaning of the text. They just change the wording of the text. And there's, there's a fair number of variants. Some are quite long, some are quite short. They never change theology or truth. They just change... Minor details. Yeah, minor details. Yeah. And this is a variant reading. So don't let your faith be shaken by a sloppy monk. <laughs> you know, it's just a variant. All right. Okay, we've got to wrestle with uh, two things. The interesting. First is the, the three images of the return. When, at what time of day are two people in bed? Nighttime. At night. So he may come... All right. What time of day are two women grinding? Daytime. Yeah, early morning, probably yeah. in the morning, the cool of day. And what time of day would two men be in the field working? All day. All day. Noon, maybe, maybe early yeah. afternoon, sometime in the daytime. Yeah. So he may come. Anytime. Maybe morning, maybe noon, maybe evening, and maybe soon. Anybody want to sing along? But if you I don't, take yeah. into account <laughs> time changes. That's right. World, That's right. It's oh. different time here. Yeah. Exactly. Daylight savings time. At Saskatchewan time. Yeah. Saskatchewan time. Yeah. <laughs> so that's right. In one part of the world, it may be night when you're sleeping. The other part of the world, exactly. it may be day when you're working. Another part of the world, it may be morning, or it may be. So the son of the man could come at any time, and it could affect anybody at any time. Right. But how does it affect them? Suddenly. Suddenly. Good. Give me the easy. Then he uses the word. Taken, and that's not the Liam Neeson film we're addressing. 
All right, the word is, and there's your little notes there. Uh, the word is para lambano. That sounds very Italian, like you should be eating spaghetti when you say that. Hey, it's a para lambano. Hey, why did you just come out of para lambano? It's a spicy return. It's a spicy return. All right. Para means beside, like uh, we get paraclete, the one who comes alongside, the Holy Spirit is the paraclete. Uh, we get paratrooper, I assume, you know, a trooper who comes alongside. Uh, parabolic would be the same thing. We, we take para from that. So para means alongside. Any other para words? Periscope. Periscope. A scope that comes para alongside. Paratrooper. Paratrooper, yeah. Paraplegic. Paraplegic. That's only half. That's two, though. I think yeah. we're into Paramedia. twos there. What's that, Jody? Para, yeah, oh, that's good. Paramedic, the one, who, the medic who comes alongside. Parasite. Yeah. <laughs> Parasite that comes alongside. A site that comes alongside. All right. So parable. Parable. Yes, which is a, a story that comes that is told alongside. Good. Para, you're with the story. All right. So para means uh, beside uh, lambano means to receive or to appropriate to take. So it means to receive from another or to receive alongside. To take to oneself in close association. So if you put your pen in your pocket, your pen is paralambano. It's taken to your side. It's close to you. You've taken it and you put it close. That's the, the root of the word. Um, but it means two, it can contain two different ideas. One is to take or to receive, uh, and in this clear sense, it's to be taken. All right, so when you hear that and you think about the return of Jesus, which person goes to heaven and which person stays on earth? Let's start with the two women uh, in the, who are grinding grain. One, Jesus says, um, two women will be grinding in the same place and one will be taken and one will be left. What comes to mind? Well, as if you'd be taken to Jesus' side. So you would interpret that as the rapture? Yeah. Yes. Right. Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> <laughs> the rapture and the coming is the same thing. Yeah, the, that would be the para, para lambano, the, the second coming, yeah. All right, go to Matthew 24, 39. Let's see how Jesus uses this. No, uh, sorry, Matthew, that's, that's later on. Uh, let's do Matthew 13. Sorry about that. Great one. You bet. What verse? Let's start in verse 24. And then we'll go over to Matthew 25. Just got to get my references right here. Find one more reference. Just read that one for now. Okay. Uh, sorry, where are we? I've got you lost. Matthew 13. 24 to 30. Uh, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a man who sowed good seed in his field, but when his men were sleeping, the enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat. And when the wheat sprouted and bore grain, the tares also became evident. The slaves and landowners said, did we not sow? How then does it have tares? Uh, do you want us then to gather them up? But they said, no, for the tares will be gathered up with the tares. You may uproot the wheat with them. Allow both to grow in the harvest. First. So we get the word gathered up here. So what is Jesus talking about in this passage? Who is the gathered up and what happens to the gathered up ones? The weeds are gathered up. Yeah, so being gathered up, is a bad thing. Okay, that's judgment. Okay, go to Matthew, let's go over to 2439. Man, my brain skipped a verse here, but we'll see if it's there. So in that passage, it's a bad thing to be gathered up. First, first, right. They do gather the wheat and bring it into the barn. Right, and then we get in Matthew twenty four, uh, thirty nine. 
Oh yeah, here we go. This is the parallel passage. It's starting in 38. For in those days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark. So this is the parallel in Matthew that Luke records. And they did not understand until the flood came and took them all away. Okay, so there's our paralambano, took them all away. There's the exact same word, took. What does it mean here? Dead. They dead. <laughs> they, all, they all got killed. So here, taken means to be killed. So will the coming of the Son of Man. Then there will be two men in the field, and one will be taken, and one will be left. So he uses the exact same word here, parallel construction, parallel language. And in the first phrase, explains the meaning of the word. So in the, in the Noah, in 39, taken means to be killed. killed. So let's use that word killed instead of the word taken. Um, it's 39. And they did not understand until the flood came and killed them all. So will the coming of the Son of Man be. There were two men in the field. One will be killed and one will be left. Oh, two no. will be grinding. Women will be grinding in the mill. One will be paralambano. One will be killed and one will be left. So how does Jesus, well, that scripture interpret scripture. So how does Jesus in this passage understand the word taken? He's saying killed. Yeah, just like, because he's using the same expression as he did with those who died in the flood. Oh, now he's just meddling. Yeah, now he's... <laughs> and so I, I think based on, on how Jesus uses it here, and you know, he's quoting the same passage, that when we speak about the one taken, I don't think we're speaking about the rapture. He's talking about someone will die and one will be left. Is that... But what, what's the purpose? Like... Ah, uh, what's the purpose? This What's the purpose of killing them? This is where he says, yeah, I'm glad that you asked. <laughs> we had this conversation. Okay, you asked that question. Yeah. <laughs> Donna, wine, wine. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> What's the purpose? What has been uh, the expression before this about, about Lot and Noah? There are those who are righteous. the righteous and those who are Unbelievable. unrighteous. The judged, right? Yeah. The judged and the unjudged. And the judged, in Noah's case, the judged were judged and doomed. In Lot's case, they were judged and they were doomed. So he's saying that there are two kinds of people. One will be, one will be saved and one will be judged and doomed. Um, and I think he's saying that when the Son of Man comes, what will he do? First he's going to deal with the unjust. Yeah, he will judge. And doom them. Yeah. And then he'll deal with the righteous. That's the sense of it. Yeah. yeah. Oh. And it's the wheat and the tares, right? So is that to say that when the rapture occurs, we won't be taken first? Like, oh, you're on the next page! <laughs> <laughs> so like people won't be looking around like, hey, where's my pastor? Where's my Exactly. Friend? All right, I want to finish this up and then I want to do the next page. Good, now you're thinking good thoughts. Uh, verse 37, we'll wrap it up because they ended the last verse of the section. And answering, they said to him, where, Lord, where will they be taken? Right? Where, Lord, will they be taken? Or where will this occur? And what has Jesus said? Where are you? I'm sorry. I'm 37, now. Luke 17, 37. Okay. Back to Luke. Sorry, back to our parable here. 17, 37. Where are those dead bodies? <laughs> where are those dead bodies? Vultures. There's vultures. There's vultures, right? So where there is death, there is judgment. And where there is judgment, there's death. Huh. I, th I think they're saying where, Jesus says, where are they taken? Wherever there's bodies, they'll, they'll be killed. There's judgment here. It's an odd little expression. Remember, wherever there's vultures, there's dead bodies. Where there's dead bodies, the vultures will be gathered. Which is an interesting reference to Revelation, the vultures coming down and eating corpses and stuff. So I think based on the Matthew passage, how Jesus uses uh, Paralambao in Paralambano, in Matthew, what he's talking about is there are, at any given moment when the judgment comes, God will judge between the quick and the dead, the living and the dead. It'll be like two men walking. One will be judged and doomed. One will be judged and saved. One, two women, one will be judged and doomed. One will be judged and saved. Like two men in a field working, one will be judged. And, we've interpreted this as the rapture. But this has nothing, I don't, you'd have to read that into that to see that. Because as soon as we hear the word taken, yes. we think rapture right away, right? Yeah. Because we, we're reading it in light of 
later passages rather than reading it in light of earlier passages. We have to interpret Jesus in the light of how Jesus spoke, and this is how Jesus used the language. In the wheat and the tares, right? The wheat and the tares are taken, thrown into the fire. Now, I, I, this doesn't change a lot, because the rapture is, is a theology that, or is a, is a teaching that will occur, but it, just in the context of this. I think Larry Norman got this wrong. So it's not a literal happening, like he's not literally talking about there will be two women standing and one will be... No, I think it's a metaphor. It's a metaphor. Yeah, it's a metaphor for judgment. Okay. Yeah. That when the Son of Man comes, he will judge. And he will condemn uh, judge, the wheat and the tares. Some will be thrown into the fire and some will do wheat. And, and the Son of Man will judge. So, all right, I want to get through to Donna's question because it's 25-2 already. All right. So on the back of your page, on page 5, this is kind of the three standard. There's a lot of variants on this. But here's kind of the three standard views on the return of Jesus. So the cross is obviously the cross. All right. This little gap in here, in each of them, that's where we are now. We're somewhere on this timeline. So this is uh, 33 AD. This is an unknown date. But we're, depends on what you think, we're in this, in this little line here somewhere. All right. The first is called the pre-tribulation rapture. And there's some language I've got to get start together. Uh, Daniel speaks of, of uh, 70 weeks, 69 weeks in the seventh week. This is the seven years of judgment upon the earth. That there's seven years of... Three years, three and a half years of, eh, not so bad, and then a betrayal in the middle, and then three and a half years of the great tribulation where the bowl of the wrath of God is poured out on the earth, and we get all these things happening, right? Some teach that before that, you know what? It's time. <laughs> Bring it on. Put my chair right in here. Yeah. <laughs> James goes out like it's your corner gas uniform. Well, <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty cool. Like that, like the, uh, the what was the coffee guy? He'd every time. <sighs> oh yeah, Van Hout. Van Hout. We had a Van Hout wrap. Every time he'd say the word Van Hout, he'd point to his shoulder because he had a Van Hout patch. So I work for Van Hout Coffee, and I'd like you to purchase Van Hout Coffee. And Van Hout Co Every time he said Van Hout, he touched the shoulder. <laughs> and I'll never forget that, because I remember Van Hout Coffee now. So. Okay, so the cross occurs. And then there's a, an indeterminate amount of time. And then pre-tribulation rapture believes that Christ will call. There will be the trumpet call. And the saints uh, and uh, will ascend into heaven, meet the Lord in the air, and so be with him forever, as Thessalonians says, right? And then there will be seven years of great tribulation upon the earth, which the earth has never seen. We get the Antichrist, the mark of the beast, all that horrific seven bowls, seven cups of wrath, seven trumpets, all, uh, seven seals, all the, the seven judgments. And then Christ will, so this is like a partial return? He manifests himself to some degree within the physical realm, enough so that we can hear. Um, and this is where you get these movies like this, right? Uh, so this is a seven-year window, and then uh, Christ will descend uh, the great battle of Armageddon, Gog and Magog, all that stuff, um, and Christ then will descend, and then he will establish a thousand-year millennial kingdom, the rule and the reign of, of peace, and then there will be the great judgments, uh, and then um, there will be the eternal kingdom. Okay, that's pre-tribulation rapture. If you're of a certain age this evening, you know this. You've heard this probably all your life. Um, if you went to a certain school, you're probably familiar with this. This is James Schofield. This is, uh, who's the guy that Stuart reads the translation? That doesn't matter. Okay, that's, so you asked that question, right? And very often the passage we just read in Luke is interpreted to be that moment. Two men walking up a hill, one left disappeared, one left standing still. I wish we'd all been ready. You didn't know this was a musical evening as well, Ethan. <laughs> all right, so that's pre-trib rapture. All right. Then there's called post-trib, or sorry, mid-trib, which was taught at the Alliance Church in Nippon. We were there. Mid-trib rapture is this, that we get the cross, then we get the first three and a half years of tribulation, and then the rapture occurs in the middle of that. 
And then we get the latter half of the Great Tribulation. And then Jesus returns, does the same thing. Millennial Kingdom, Judgment, and the Eternal Kingdom. Okay, that's called Mid-Tribulation Rapture. Then there's what's called the Post-Tribulation Rapture. And that is same thing, indeterminate time. The Tribulation begins, everybody goes through the Tribulation. And then at the end of the Tribulation, Christ calls, Christ returns, and those who are dead in Christ will be raised to meet the Lord in the air, um, and will they will not rule and reign until after. By the way, the saints that are raptured here and the saints that are raptured here do not rule and reign until here. And that's They all agree on that. So uh, the saints will be here, and then there'll be the Millennium Kingdom, and the same, same thing. This back, back half doesn't change. The question is, when does Christ come for his bride? Does he come before seven years of, of hardship, in the middle of seven years of hardship, or at the end of seven years of hardship? Pre-trib, mid-trib, and post-trib raptures. That's the three traditional Protestant views uh, of the rapture. So in answer to Donna's question, when is the church? And we're going to look at Thessalonians in, in the coming weeks in, in Sunday morning as Paul addresses this issue. As he says, um, with the trump, with the, short, with the voice, the shout of the archangel, then we, the dead will, Christ will rise first, then we who are alive and remain will meet together and be with the Lord forever. Like that's, and the word rapture is not in the Bible. It's not a biblical term. It just means the great joy of the church. It's a rapturous event. You, know, you can be enraptured by anything. Uh, so the rapture never is one of those non-biblical words, but we've used it to describe an event. Uh, it's called the parousia, the, the return of Christ. Para, the coming alongside. Mm -hmm. Our word of the day, like on Pee-wee's Pee -wee's Playhouse, <laughs> para. So it depends what you've been taught. Um, and I don't know, like say, for many of us growing up, this Pre-trib rapture was all we were taught. At Berean, where Don and I went, was a very conservative school. Uh, this was taught. The Christian Missionary Alliance does not have a position on any of this, except to this point. Uh, we, you know, as a denomination, we teach the Millennial Kingdom, but as far as the rapture goes, <laughs> you're grown-ups. You can decide for yourselves. It really doesn't matter what you think. It's going to be what it's going to be. <laughs> well, I know. It's, it's true enough. I'm also a pan, I'm a pan tribulationist. It'll all pan out in the end. <laughs> kind of a position I take. I, I kind of look at that though, and I think, you know, it makes me think of the story of Lazarus and the rich man, and how that guy said, well, can you go back and tell my, my brother or my family? Yeah. And he says, you know what, they had all the prophets. They That's had right. all these guys. They've been told. They're not, they, you could go tell them again. It wouldn't make a difference. So kind of, yeah. to me, kind of from that, and kind of think that, you know, it would be nice, you know, in a sense for mid-trip or whatever that, you know. Yeah, it'd be hey, nice not to have to go wake through up this. You all heard it. Yeah. Now you can see it's real. Mm -hmm. or everybody would believe that. Yeah. yeah. You'd be crazy not to. Yeah. <laughs> it, it's interesting. I, I got to wrap this up. We've got five minutes in. The traditional, or the 20th and the 19th and 20th century image of the rapture is, is you know, bodies going whoop into space, yep. and then just cloth, you know, or the, the street cars. I love that. Trains will crash, and street cars, and butchers won't be able to go to work. You know, it's just great. <laughs> <laughs> so the image of a Missed body... work. Oh, no. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Preacher's gone. And all these left-behind movies, you know, trade on that imagery. Yep. Augustine, uh, one of the early church fathers, taught that all Christians will just fall down and die. And their spirit will ascend to be with the Lord, mm. and they'll get new heavenly bodies. So a very different. So if you made that movie instead of everybody just going, you know, all of a sudden one day millions of people just die instantly, and you have to explain away the death of instant death of millions of people. So I, I, it, it does it matter? No, not at all. But it's fascinating. It's it's speculative. It's thought provoking. It's thought provoking. Yeah. So you can decide. Um, I have my own theories. I remember I was teaching on this a few years ago, and one lady and I, I contradicted uh, a certain lady's position and her favorite teachers, and she walked up and said, "So you know more than?" And she started listing all these names of people she'd read, and I said, "Well, I guess I do." But, <laughs> <laughs> no, I thought that. <laughs> I would have never said that. So. <laughs> I have a position, but you know what? It's, it, it's not a hill on which I'm willing to die. What I am willing to die on is Jesus is coming back. That, that we cannot misinterpret. Okay, I want to wrap this up. I, 
I'm going to give you the last two pages to take home. <laughs> there are 50 ways. Yes, I know. I know what you're thinking, yes, <laughs> Paul Simon. Yes, yes. <laughs> Why is the doctrine of the second coming of Christ important? If some of it's up for debate, if it's been abused, it's been led, used to, to produce fear in people. I mean, when we watched Thief in the Night as children, oh, we were yeah. terrified. You know, and all these end time movies were just... So how does the New Testament use the doctrine of the second coming? And I'm just going to point out a couple of them, but there are 50 ways in which the doctrine of the second coming is used in Scripture. And what you won't see here is terror. Uh, let me just read to uh, the very first one, and I, the references are all there. You don't have to... Obviously, we, will, we don't have a shred of time to look at them. But... Uh, to give us an interest in the blessed second coming, to encourage our faithfulness by saying he, the reward of Christ, to bring out hope uh, of the reward of regeneration, uh, to avoid the Antichrist deception, uh, to show the conditions of the world will get worse and worse and worse, and not to be surprised when the world gets in worse, you know, to incite, uh, obviously this is not my material, because uh, I would never write to incite number 10, to incite ministerial fidelity, uh, to be faithful servants, to hold forth that there is judgment, to confess Christ, to cause us to pray, to give us a sense of expectation. You look at 19, to, lo to lead to love and desire, uh, to keep us working for the kingdom. Number 22, to encourage joy and peace at the coming of Christ, to inspire hope in the resurrection, to incite heaven, number 30, to excite heavenly mindedness, to arouse brotherly love, to comfort us in our, in our loss in number 34. Uh, you know, to consider the defeat of our enemy in 36, to be a sober-minded people, to give us hope in, verse, in number 40, to make us persevere in number 41, to cause us to draw near and abide with Christ to 40, to be patient under trial, you know, all these things, to, you know, to bring salvation. And the last one, to coming gladness and exceeding joy. Do you see any fear-mongering in this? No. No. Scripture never uses the coming of Christ as a, as a root of fear. It is to cause us joy and hope in the death of our loved ones that they will be resurrected, to help us to see that, not be despairing when we see the conditions of the world, uh, to avoid misjudging, to cause us to love one another and to be steadfast and faithful and obedient, all these wonderful things. That's why the teaching of end times is here for us, not to make us crazy. You know, so much of this makes us crazy. You know, I got to stock up on ammunition. You know, and, and remember Y2K, you know, uh, and, and to divide us and to and cause uh, these, these horrific things. Rather, it was always intended for our good, to incite us to prayer, to give us encouragement and joy and provide comfort with one another. Therefore, Paul, uh, Paul writes, therefore, comfort one another with these words, not strike terror into the heart of your neighbor with these words, you know. Uh, so that's it. Is Jesus coming? Yes. When he's coming like a thief in the night. But you'll know it. <laughs> Don't have to worry. Did I miss the rapture? <laughs> you know, did I miss the second coming? Was I on my phone? I haven't seen Michael in a while. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Well, that's a whole other story. Um, <laughs> it will be like lightning in the sky. We just you will... don't know what will happen after that. Right. And some of the happenings we don't, you know, we have some theories. And one of these days we'll preach through Revelation, Joyce, and stumble our way heavenward together. Wonderful. Yeah, it's, it's, it's there to comfort us, to give us encouragement in time in darkness. So, all right, let's wrap it up. Quarter two. Any thoughts? Lots, but you don't have time for it. Yes, I will end with the words of uh, not Jack Van Hill, of uh, Perry F. Rockwood. Yeah, Perry F. Rockwood. Maranatha, friends. Even so, come quickly, Lord Jesus. Amen. All right, we'll see you. I just wanted to say thanks. I'm glad you came along. Partner.